Hello, this is Out of the Blue comes Francis Zhu. I'm Francis, and welcome to my show. Hi, everyone. My guest this week is Kenneth Clifford. I first met Kenneth. When I was traveling in England in 2016, Kenneth then came to Living Miracles community in the same year, and has been living in the community full time ever since. Kenneth has this huge willingness、uh, to forgive, forgive everything, and hasn't really been. A very smooth and easy journey for him, and only recently I found out some of the stories, some of the stories on his journey, and、um, they're very, very transformative and very inspiring. And today's episode was actually pre-recorded because it happened very spontaneously. I ran into him、uh, one day this week. We just started to talk, and one topic led to the next. The energy just got higher and higher as we talk, and there was so much joy. So I thought to myself, I had to capture this. And in the end, we just、uh, sit down and press the record button and recorded this episode. So it is a lot of fun, <laughs> and I hope you re- really enjoy this. And also, I want to mention that Kenneth also、um, does a weekly show called "Get Real." It is a show that he does on Zoom, and、um, it is also streamed on YouTube. And David Hofmeister has been a consistent guest on his show, so I highly recommend that you check it out. It is broadcast also on Thursdays. So, enjoy today's episode. Hi, Kenneth. Hi, Francis. <laughs>、mm. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you. Yeah. Because,、um, you know, just talking with you about your life journey, I I always feel really touched. I don't know why. I think sometimes, I I wonder how you know I got even.、Um, Called by Jesus when I didn't even know Jesus, who he was, and and then looking at your life, <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, that is such an amazing love story,、mm-hmm. you know. But also, yeah, I guess I just also love listening to to you, just because for me, I think we have such different upbringings. It almost like. Listening to you make me feel like I I live I got to live that life, <laughs> not that you know I would choose to live another earthly life, but just the fact to listen to all these、um, ups and downs, it feels like oh my god, I don't know something feels liberating in my heart. Just、mm. feeling oh my god, that feels really nice to hear、mm. every bit of it. So, yeah, but maybe, yeah, we can just see how how it comes through. But this topic that we pick today is from Jesus to you. Yeah, you have never disappointed me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> How did that come about to you? Wow, that was a that's a very beautiful thing that happened in my life、um, from Jesus, and I feel honoured and deeply grateful that He changed me. And、um, how it came about was some time because He'd already sort of blessed me with His grace many, many times.、Um, God, yeah, He'd opened me up several times. Maybe like the, the 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 first time. I mean, I didn't I didn't even know it was him. But、um, the first time was that、uh, 
I went for a walk and I was being extremely present. I wasn't into a course or anything like that. And I was just being completely present and I was just practicing that. And then all of a sudden I looked up at the trees and um, there were birds in the trees. And all of a sudden the birds, as if like I sort of joined with them or something, and it just, the birds just flew. And my whole perception changed as if I'd never seen the birds flying in the way they did. They just flew. And I was just in awe of what they did. And I was like, wow, what's just happened? And then all of a sudden my sort of, my vision came back and I was like, what? what was that? Uh Wow, my perception just completely changed. It just felt heart opening. So that was the, actually, that wasn't actually the first contact. The first contact was actually as a child. Um, That was the second time he contacted me. The first time was, I was about seven years old. I was sat on a lake and I was just sitting there being peaceful and I just sat down and it was just like this beautiful evening. And I'm just looking out of the water and thinking, well, it's just amazing, isn't it? <laughs> you know, just as like a child. And all of a sudden, my whole vision just changed. Mm-hmm. And everything became sparkly. Mm-hmm. And it was like sparkly and beautiful. Because I was a child, I just thought this was normal. You know, I was just like, wow, this is really amazing. <laughs> it was like that. And then all of a sudden, my vision just changed. And it was funny because my mum and dad would take me to, we would go to that place because we enjoyed it. And I would always try and sit in that spot and think, oh, that's going to happen again. And mm-hmm. of course, it never happened. But I didn't really have the words to explain it to my mum and dad. I just thought, oh, mm-hmm. I, guess, I guess we all experience it, you know. There wasn't really anything to talk about. And then, of course, coming on this journey um, later, I was like, oh, wow, that was uh, an, an, an opening in my mind. So... It's been interesting because I, my life was, I never thought he was in my life, but he's been in my life the whole time. He never left me and he never will. And so then the second time he contacted me was, um, no, sorry, I told the second, and then it was the third time, which was a, a deeper experience. This was a week after I'd seen the birds flying. And then I'm stood outside my psychotherapist's um, supervisor's Um, house and I was a bit early and I look up at the sky and I'm just looking at the sky it's a normal grey day in England and then the sky just bowed to me and (laughs) and it just went it went it went into me it just went into me and it was like as if this sound came over it just went and I was like and then it just went and it just went back into its position and I was just like what the hell is happening Mm -hmm. to me and so this was when I started to think, well, perception mm-hmm. is a very, is, it's not what, I, what, not what I perceived. And so then that got me really interested in what is going on here. Mm-hmm. And then it was one Christmas, it was um, before Christmas, and I was getting more into meditation and stuff. And I was completely against Jesus. I was like, I'm not into religion. I'm not into anything like that. But I started to think, actually, who is Jesus? And that, before that Christmas, of whenever mm-hmm. it was, Um, I started researching him Mm. and I realized, oh, he was just an enlightened being. He was just radiating light. Okay, that's pretty cool. So I started um, just watching documentaries on him and it was like my sort of forgiveness with him. It's like, okay, I'm just letting go of all this. Okay, he's, he's pretty cool. And then that Christmas, every year, me and my dad go out on the 24th of December and we go and buy my mum's presents. We've done it since I was little. So we go out. And we go to this final charity shop, and my dad says, oh, I'm going to go in here. I said, oh, yeah, you go in. I've, I, I've had enough. So I'm stood outside like this, just, not, just normally looking around. I'm looking outward from the window. And I turn around to the window of the shop, and there's this picture of Jesus. And Jesus is staring at me. And I'm like, <laughs> what, what? like and, and I can't take my eyes off him. Mm. Now I'm with my dad and I'm thinking if my dad sees me staring at Jesus, he's going to think, what the hell are you up to? And I'm just like looking and the painting was only £10 and I was like, I want it. I wanted it. But I was like, I didn't have the guts Mm. to buy it because I was with my dad. And he was just, Jesus was staring at me. Mm. And then I sort of moved away and I thought, wow, what was all that about? And then funny enough, A Course in Miracles came in the February. Mm Mm-hmm. So it was it was sort of quick afterwards. And, yeah, so... That's interesting. Yeah. Cause I, I remember I had a similar experience um, somewhere before I, I moved from China to Australia. Yeah. I had this just out of the blue curiosity. Mm. Who is Jesus? 
who is Jesus? And even though in, in China there was nobody talking about it, but I suddenly just had this curiosity out of the, out of the blue. <laughs> so the first thing I went to Australia was to go to church in order to find out about him and what, what the Bible um, is all about. And yet that has never really um, resonated for mm. some reason. And yet there is something resonating because every time I sit in church, I just want to cry the hell yeah. out of, you know, and have no reason. Yeah. I just want to be there and cry. Mm. And all these emotions that rise up, you know, that's another thing. Because I, you know, when I was talking with you, you know, there was a time earlier, I guess, in my life at least, I just shut down completely knowing that, you know, there there is all that I felt growing yeah. up was abandonment mm. and then the emotion was too hard to handle. Exactly. So I made a decision that I would not cry anymore. Mm. And then with that decision, everything was repressed. And even there was so much pain after that with my physical body mm. for, for many, many years. But, you know, you, when I sit in the church for no reason, no understanding, all this emotion and tears started to come for, <laughs> for no reason. But yeah. I, I know you also had some kind of yeah. huge um, flooding of emotion um, moment. Yeah. Something just to uh, push you to that point. Yeah. Well, um, I didn't believe in love. I didn't believe there was love here. I didn't believe in it at all. I thought it was made up. It was fictitious. And um, I didn't want to be a part of it through... Of course, is that the feelings of rejection, abandonment, were so crippling to me as the same as you that I just couldn't, I just couldn't handle it. It was just awful. I felt absolutely terrible. And what happened for me actually, it was that I was reading, I was reading spiritual books, and every single one of them had one, two themes in common: it was oneness, and then the experience of unconditional love. And this is when I put the dots together in my mind. I thought, wow. Everything else that I've ever sort of looked into, philosophy, psychotherapy, everybody else is always arguing who's right, who's wrong. But this one, when you really look at it, religion and everything like that, ultimately, when you get underneath it all, yeah, there is one reality um, and it's all unconditional love. Mm -hmm. So I thought they all can't be wrong, can they? Mm -hmm. So this sounds like this is worth going towards. And so I thought, wow, my life has been all about not loving. It's, it's an unloving place, so I'm not interested in it. And this actually sort of like was my last chance in a way. And I was just like, if this is real, you need to show me it. And this is when, then, then, then when the course came along, it was a year into having the course. Got the course, and I'd been doing it for a year. And I thought, okay then, um, and he'd show me, I'd, I'd, had, I'd, had, I'd had beautiful experiences with it, really amazing experiences, and just, it was like a Kundalini experience, really. It was like my whole body just started shaking, and then all of a sudden my vision just changed, and then I just felt love for everyone around me. And it was just like, <sighs> and felt this love deep in my heart. I was, I was just, this love was sort of like hitting me. I was like, <gasps> oh my God, oh my God, what's happening to me? That was the first one through, through through the course. So that was a sort of that 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 was a, that was that was my glimpse at it. Um, but I still needed to convince him. So from that point on, I said, "Okay, then Jesus, if I'm going to follow you, so I really put it on him. If I'm going to follow you, I need to know that this unconditional love is real. Mm-hmm. What you're saying is real. I need it. I want it. That's the only thing I want. And that was my prayer. I set my prayer on it. That was the end of it. If I'm going to follow you." This is what I want. And he delivers. <laughs> he delivers. Was that the point where, because um, I know that there was a point in, in your life that you really were almost like jumping off cliff, so God, to yeah. speak. God, yeah. Was that before then or after? Oh, that was, um, this is now um, way after. Way after. Yeah, way after all of that. The, the jump and the, the, the point when I was at my, at my brink was I was 22. So um, the, the straw that broke the camel's back <laughs> was that 
ha I, I thought I had a child and I found out that that child wasn't mine. And at the time I was taking, I was taking drugs, I was going around fighting, I was angry. Um, the girl that I was with was pregnant, I wanted to take it on. I, I, she told me like it may not have been mine at the time, but I, couldn't, I didn't want to take the risk. So I decided to, like I wanted to be there at the birth, I went there all to the birth. And then five months later, I just wanted to find out for myself. I said, listen, I just want to do the test if Taylor's mine. And to me, of course, I never communicated this, but to me it didn't matter. He was now mine, and that was the end of it. But then when the test result came back, she read the test result before me and decided, okay, I need to tell the father. So she told the father before me and then said, I'm going to move in that direction because I can't do this to him, which was, you know... Of course, it was, it was fair enough, but I was completely and utterly devastated. And so that took me to, to the edge. And then I started to take more and more drugs, get more and more violent and just out of control, really. And so then it, thank God, I, I'm actually so grateful that I, that happened because if I hadn't had, had such a tip and off point, I don't know where I'd have ended up. I mean, as I say, I think I'd have probably killed someone, I'd have probably overdosed, or I'd be in prison for something mm. right now, and that's probably the best that I could have come up with. That's and where the life was heading. That's where life was, that, that was the only way it was heading, that was, the, that was the end of it. And what happened was, is the emotions were just coming up, I was just crying and crying and crying, uncontrollably, mm. um, at times, when I was coming down from the drugs, I just couldn't control what was happening to me, and like, my friends around me were just have another beer, calm yourself down, you know, it's going to be all right. Like, no one knows what they're going to do. And lucky enough, I met, this, I met this girl and she had a child. And so she could understand a little bit. And then she had psychotherapy um, because her mum had mental, mental health issues. And so she said, listen, I feel like you should go and see a therapist. Mm -hmm. And um, like, this might help you with like getting up whatever's in there. Because I just didn't know how to talk about it. And so she was my sort of saving grace to, to give me that. And so it felt like bef but before that conversation with her, I was on this edge. It was literally, I was looking into pure darkness. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I have been as dark as I possibly could. You know, I've really smashed people up. I've beaten the, de I've beaten the death out of people. I'm not joking you. <laughs> you know, it's the God's honest truth. It's like I had to be dragged off mm -hmm. because if I was in a fight, I wanted to kill him. And I was going to do everything that I possibly could. Mm -hmm. And it just became... Like I was, I was, I was, in, I was, I was a nightmare. I was, I, I lost it. I lost it. Mm. And um, yeah, you know, people would say he's out of control. He's mm. mad. He's mad. He's just violent mm. and dangerous. I'm just dangerous. I was just, yeah. Someone looked at me the wrong way. It's just you're getting knocked out, mate. Like look at me again, and it's going to be game over. It's just like that. I was just so angry, and this was happening. And then I'm like, why does this keep happening to me? <laughs> um, so it was awful. And so what happened was, is I got to this edge of like, thank God, found out the child wasn't mine because that sort of like eliminated everything really. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking into this darkness, and it's like. Okay, I'm probably going to end up accidentally probably killing someone or maybe even purposely killing someone. I'm going to end, either end up having a drug overdose or something crazy is going to happen because I was also selling drugs at times or someone else is going to have an overdose and I'm going to get done for it or whatever. You know, it's just crazy, isn't it? It's like it's going one way and I'm staring at it and I'm looking out and I'm at the crossroads in my life. At 21, I think I was. Oh, and the tip of the iceberg was is that I found out that Taylor wasn't mine and then a few months later my granddad died mm. and he was the one that I was closest to. And granddad said to me, promise me you'll always look after Taylor before he died. And I said, I promise you I will. Mm -hmm. And then he died and then that just broke me in two that I couldn't keep my promise to him. And so the one in my life is now gone and I have no answers because I would go to him and he would help me with everything. And now my unconditional love is now gone. I'm on my own and I don't know what to do. So yeah, I was completely murderous. I wanted a murder. I wanted to kill. And I knew it was, it was just a matter of time before something happened because I felt it inside of me. It was that dark. I knew I was capable of it. I'd already got to that point in my mind. I'm just capable of whatever I want now. But it's just, is it going to happen? <laughs> so I'm just rolling the dice of life and just, what's going to happen? It's going to happen, you know? 
and it seems it's out of control. Mm. But what happened was, is I'm on the cliff now. I'm literally looking out at the whole thing, and I'm just saying, kill, be killed, drug overdose. Well, that's pretty easy. That's easy. That's the easy life. Mm. That's the easy life for me now. Mm. Or, and then something in my mind now, obviously Jesus said, turn round mm. and face everything you've done. And it was like, that's the easy route. And the, the, thank God I've got a, this strong will in me. I love a challenge. Mm-hmm. I love a challenge. And I was like, killing someone's the easy route. I mean, that's kind of crazy to say, but that's the easy way. Mm. The hard way is face mm. everything I have done. And is there light? Is there light? You know, is there light for me? That's, it, it's funny that word came into my mind because it was like, well, I've gone to the darkness. I've gone to the brink of that. There's no further really, than just going completely wild. So let's see if there's light. At the time, did you feel like actually go backward, I mean, just turn around and then face everything is harder? God, yeah. God, yeah. That was the harder thing, wasn't it? To face the guilt. To face (laughs) what you've done. You know, it's like you've just been a destructive, like, windmill, you know. You've just smashed up the whole place, right? You haven't cared about anyone or anything. Mm. No one's feelings. Your mum and dad's up all night long worrying about you. When's he going to come home? Mm. You know, I've got a metal arm. I've 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 got a scar all the way down there. Mm. My whole arm is, this arm is metal through getting beaten up Mm. because my arm was snapped. Mm. Um, There was that. I got... I got into a fight with a whole gang on my own. They completely smashed me up. And then one of them smashed me over the head with a a whiskey bottle. And I'm on the floor and they're kicking me in. And then this guy comes over and just about, you know, okay, leave him alone. (laughs) And I'm still trying to get up. And he's like, just calm down, mate. Just relax. You need to go to hospital. Because I was on drugs. So I was like, right. And he's like, just calm down. I'm like... Yeah, you're right, actually. <laughs> then <laughs> mum and dad have to come up to the hospital. There's all me beat to death. What mm. the hell have you done? So I put them through absolute hell, you know. Mm-hmm. So they're always, like, worried about me and don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. And so it was like, yeah, as I said, the whirlwind. I've just smashed up the whole place. And now I'm choosing, what, to go back and look at the devastation that you did and own it? I mean, mm-hmm. what are you thinking, you mm-hmm. know? So as I shared with you earlier, it's like I can see why people don't do it because Mm -hmm. the guilt is awful Mm. and violence is just a terrible thing. People don't, you you share that. So that, that, that started eliminating friends and different bits and pieces and having good people around me. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I was really stuck or I have to lie and don't share, but I feel like I'm a fraud, you know? Um, and so, yeah, it was like turn around and face it. So when you made that decision in your yeah. mind, it, um, I'm getting on a British accent right now. You are. Like, <laughs> <And> so. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to you, like, I'm, I want to talk like that. But when, when you turn around and mm. um, and face everything, how, how did that look? You got into um, become a psychotherapist. Yeah. Well, what happened was, is so um, the seed had been sowed from the girlfriend at the time that said, maybe you need psychotherapy. And that plant went in. And me and my sister are very close. And so I've now turned around from the cliff. I'm like, I can't do this on my own. I mean, I was paranoid wreck. I was absolutely paranoid. I mean, like someone's staring at me and it's like, you know, I'm ready to go. You know, cars are slowing down and I'm like... What's up with you then, mate? You know, it's just like I am completely alert for danger, danger, danger. And so going anywhere that I don't know or whatever, I'm just this moody character. Uh-huh. Everything is a hassle. Going in shops, the whole thing, uh-huh. you know, anything can be. Because when you start doing those things, it starts to attract, doesn't it? You know, next minute you're down the road and someone else is uh-huh. calling you out. And... uh so what happened was, is I got straight on the phone to my sister. I need help. Mm-hmm. I need help. She's like, yeah. I said, Kerry, you've got to help me. I need real help. You've got to get me a therapist. Well, I, I don't know. Kerry, you need to help me. I can't do it. I can't, I'm not phoning them up. You've just got to deal with it. Mm. So luckily, she was at work. She turned around to one of her friends. Hey, listen, my brother's not good. Mm-hmm. He needs a therapist. 
the woman goes, I know a brilliant therapist. He's really, really good. He can help. She goes, okay, great. Mm. So she gets on the phone to him and says, hey, listen, he really needs help. He can't ring you. He won't ring you. Like, so I'm guessing, I don't even know what she said. I'm guessing she sort of shared, like, listen, he's pretty wild, but he won't ring you up. And he said, okay, bring him down then. So, <laughs> so I think it was about a week later. I then had to explain myself to my mum and dad. And my mum and dad said, yeah, we'll pay for therapy. I said, I don't want you to pay for therapy. I'm going to pay myself. I, I, I did it. I need, to, mm-hmm. I need to do this. And I said, okay, mm-hmm. fine. I was pretty stubborn. So Kerry takes me down there. <laughs> Kerry takes me down there. And I'm, I'm pretty tight with money. So I thought, listen... And it was like about £30 at the time. So I was like, well, listen, I'm paying him. I'm telling him everything. <laughs> I'm not holding back. <laughs> so, and this was the change. This was amazing. So I sat in the chair. I couldn't even look at him in the eyes. We spoke about this. I sat in the chair. And I had my head down like this. I said, all right. And I sat down. Couldn't even look at him. And I said, this has happened. That's happened. I had this kid. Blah, blah, blah. That pretty much took up the whole time. I just told the whole story. I am out of control, I'm taking this amount of drugs, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, blah, 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 blah. And then finally, we're getting to the end of the session, I look up like this, as if to say, listen, mate, you're a lost cause. <laughs> there, there, is no hope. there is no hope for you, you know, that's what I was expecting him to say. And then he looked me straight in the eyes and he said, this is the only thing he said to me on the first session and it was game over for me. He said, I know I can help you. Mm. and he said, but you've got to do one thing, thing for me. I said, yeah, what's that then? He said, you've got to stop taking drugs, and you're going to get through this. Will you do that? And I said, yeah. Fair enough, I'll do it then. So we got up, we shook hands, and I made that promise, and I did. Mm-hmm. And I did. And then that's when I started pouring out my heart to him. Mm-hmm. For two and a half years. So how did you how did you three, become three a, a psychotherapist yourself? Well, through him, <laughs> which was amazing. So he was like, I would just talk and share, and it was the first. I, I just felt listened to by this guy, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. It was just felt beautiful. I felt like he really got me. He's an amazing guy. And he said, what What do you want? What do you want to do? And I said. I've got no qualifications. The doors are shut for me. And he said, well, you could go back and do maths and English. I said, I'm not doing that. No way. I'm not doing that. I can't stand school. I can't stand maths. I'm not doing all of that of nonsense. And he said, okay, okay, well, you know, just think about what you want. But I'd love this connection with him, right? And, I, and, and I, so I started thinking about what I wanted. And I thought, I want to sit there and do what he does. I want to do these one-on-one sessions. So I said to him, so I came back. This is like after, this is, sorry, two and a half years later now. I said, I want to be like you. He said, do it then. And I said, but I can't. He said, yes, you can. And I said, but how? He said, well, you can enroll, actually, and you don't need any qualifications. And I was like, really? So he told me all about it, didn't do anything about it. So it took another year of me going into his office. I want to be like you. Do it then. Do it then. He kept saying it. And then finally, I plucked up the courage and then went down to the college, which was completely and utterly (laughs) anxiety-driven. And then this is where I was sharing with you, you know, Jesus was behind the whole thing. I go down there, I'm shaking like a leaf. I mean, my voice, I sound like a robot, where I'm so nervous going in there. And I walk in there like this, and the woman's there, and I'm like, hello, can I enrol on the counselling course? Of course, I want to speak a lot, but that's how I felt. She went, yes, of course you can, dear. And then in that moment, she said to me, and if you're doing the counselling course, you need a placement. So you should go down to, off the record, a voluntary place for children. You should go and do that. Mm. Voluntary counsellors. So because I built up this courage, I was like, I can't go do it. I'll get back in my car. And then I go down there. I'm nervous. So the next minute, I'm signed up now for a voluntary, voluntary service. And I'm enrolled on the counselling cl- course. And here, and, and here we are. Mm. And admittedly, you know, there's, there's, there's some other miracles in that, actually. Um, because when I went to the um, off the record, um, the, the counselling thing, they told me to do this class. And I had to do four weeks. You had to do every single one. It was a weekend, a Saturday and Sunday for four weeks. Yeah. But you have to complete every single one to become a volunteer. On the third one, I didn't turn up. 
Mm. I wasn't feeling very well from a night out <laughs> drinking. <laughs> so I had to phone up and say, sorry, I'm not feeling very well. Jesus was behind the whole thing. So I completely screwed it up. On the Monday, they ring me up. They say, hey, how are you doing? I'm like, yeah, I'm feeling much better now. Thank you very much. They said, can you come down to the office? Would you, would you do that? I said, yeah, sure, I'll come down. I'll come down there. So the manager and everything were there. And they said, well, you know, you, you know that um, you need to complete every single uh, session to uh, be a volunteer with us. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely understand that. She said, well, we want to give you a second chance. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah. Mm-hmm. She said, will you make up and do the work that, 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 that we set for that time? We really loved everything you shared and we think you're going to be great with the young people. Mm -hmm. So we want to give you another chance. Okay then. So gave me another chance. And then then that opened up that they did all three trainings. Mm -hmm. And then that gave me enough qualifications then to go on Mm -hmm. to actually go to college and then eventually university. Mm. Yeah. So would you say that actually after you turn around to say, okay, well then I'm going to choose... The other way, which is to face everything, exactly, is actually not as bad or as hard as you thought, is oh. it? Was it? Uh, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was. It, it was hard because of the guilt. Mm-hmm. It was hard. It was extremely hard. I felt it very hard to get in contact with my emotions and how I was feeling and mm. everything like that. So it was either angry or joyful. <laughs> I can be, I'm a lively character, you know, mm-hmm. I always have been. Mm-hmm. But the other part was just being in touch with anger. So I didn't really, I wasn't in touch with anything else. However, yeah, you are right. You are right. There was some ease. It was, it was, it was like I could breathe. And so what I did is I started supporting people in the, in, in the community with disabilities and things because then I was responsible for someone. Mm. So then I couldn't go out and drink and do all these things because if I got to get up and give someone their medication in the morning, like mm-hmm. I was responsible for them. So I needed to do that. Mm-hmm. And then that actually helped me mm-hmm. like shift. Mm-hmm. And then I started pouring in it, my heart into helping people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's kind of like my experience because because I grew up like okay, <laughs> I know there's a term called goody two shoes, <laughs> 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 like just trying to be appropriate, being good good girl and everything, oh, yeah. and yet um, there was a guilt, you know, I couldn't pinpoint because mm. no matter what I do, I still felt guilt. So the the only solution is to do better, to do more, to do better, to be more. Exactly. Um, and yet, I think when I started to have all these suddenly all this emotion rise up, it wasn't easy in a way that it wasn't controllable anymore. My yeah. life couldn't really stay in control as I wanted anymore. Yeah. So it became really. Um, kind of taking off on its own yeah so it felt a bit out of control it felt new and yet even i i i remember when i first you know um take on leadership role uh when i came to community you know first time was really good because i was following and there was inner anger yeah. about authorities definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but it was yeah. it was um once i click with that everything mm. felt really easy and then very soon i was asked to step up into leading a house mm. and i felt all this rage <laughs> came at me mm. um and that was something I never faced before which was people were angry at me mm. you know i never allowed that yeah that was the emotion that that you were so in touch with mm. and it was something I never really allowed mm. myself to get in touch with and I was terrified of any anybody being angry. Mm. And yet so that that phase when I look back it it was difficult because it was new and like opening mm. a floodgate of something I was most af- afraid of. Mm. And yet deep inside there was this freedom. Is this the worst? Is this is this is this it? Yeah. Is this 
all that is really yeah. like that's what I have been afraid of all along mm. and somehow to face it head on even though there were these um, desire to change the situation to to say I don't want it and I I couldn't help but feeling deep down there was also some kind of release and freedom that I I had never really tasted mm. this freedom like I don't have to conform anymore. Mm. This is <laughs> um I can I can just let it be. Yeah. I can let everything be exactly as they are. But I was <laughs> yeah, wondering whether that was the same for yeah. you, even though like facing something is basically feeling like you tap into the realm of the unknown because yeah. The other realm, the killing, the violence, yeah. was very known. And yeah, it's easy. As you said, it was easy. And then when you turn around, it suddenly is like, okay, mm. I got no idea how <laughs> how to even do this. But I, yeah. I bet there was a lot of emotions and yeah, crying up, flushing oh, up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was really, yeah. As you said, that was such a relief because the thing was, is I always felt like I had a lot of emotion. And I always felt very, very misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And of course, all the violence and everything was this deep unworthiness. I felt so unworthy. Mm -hmm. And that gave me some sort of worth, some sort of power. And so that's what I was covering up. And mm -hmm. then through getting in touch with all of that, it was, a, it, was a, it was a relief to have those big cries. And of course, it was also very shameful as well to cry mm -hmm. because... I was told that that's not appropriate mm -hmm. as a man. You know, mm -hmm. you don't cry. So there was so much shame. Oh God, it was it, it was awful. But as you said, finally, at least I was being I was actually being being honest. You know, mm -hmm. of, of how I truly felt, and starting to get in contact with some vulnerability. You know, like I really I'm actually feeling vulnerable. Mm. And then that was like, oh, what's what what's this? So mm -hmm. it was actually very beautiful to go on that journey. Mm -hmm. I feel so grateful for that. Yeah, it was. That was the next phase. You're right was opening up to all the emotions that I'd been hiding for so long. Mm -hmm. And then how did the message that um, from Jesus came to you that you have never disappointed me? I think <laughs> that was such a beautiful, loving message. Yeah. Probably it's, the impact is way beyond that word yeah. and sentence. But it's, yeah, how did that come? Yeah, well, that was, that, that was actually at La Casa de Milagros when that happened. And... Um, I was experiencing this love and I was just sat with Jesus and I felt him so, so close to me. Um, and um, I was looking at my mind um, like uh, as, as if I was with him. I was just like completely with him. And what I did is I looked around at all the people there and I realized that I'd been touched by Jesus in such a deep way. And there was a sort of a strength in, strength in my heart, which I seemingly saw that, others were sort of seeking for and I saw them as being nice people I saw them as being good I thought wow they deserve I felt so unworthy it was like why didn't you give it to Anna you know look at her she's so sweet she she deserves it she's she's wanted God all of her life why come to me first mm -hmm. and I would look at all these ones I thought they've never done anything that I've done and yet he came to me so I was I was sitting there I was sitting by the pool actually and I was just sitting with him and I was saying, Jesus, I've kicked people's heads in. I've meant to do it. And I was sh sh showing all these sort of like acts that I hadn't been able to forgive. And I'm saying, Jesus, listen, I'm telling you who I am. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't have to grace me any longer. You, you know, I felt like, listen, you've given me enough. Like, mm -hmm. go, and, go and give to everybody else because you've changed my life. It's like I'm not going to take the whole cake or something. Like, I've, I've, I've had my, my piece and you've 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 transformed me that's for sure without a shadow of a doubt but i don't deserve this and i said jesus i did this jesus i did that mm. what about this what about that mm. and i went through the major things that had sort of haunted me at nights and different bits and pieces and then i said all of that and i felt you know sad i felt and i said and i've and i and i let you down I let you, you know, look, look what I did. I let, I let you down. And then it was as if the voice just came through. And he said, Kenneth, you never disappointed me. Hmm. And I never use the word disappoint. I just don't use it. And I just went, bang. I just started crying my eyes out like he'd penetrated my heart or something. And I knew that he was being sincere. Kenneth, 
you've never disappointed me. And I was just crying and crying and crying. And it was just so beautiful. And I was just saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I just said, and then right at the end of it, I said to him, you don't see what I see, do you? And he said, no, I don't. Hmm. And that was it. Hmm. And now it seems to be my message, you know. Hmm. I know that this has touched many people. So if this can help, then that's what I want. Hmm. Yeah. I also like the fact that you're so grateful, you know, even just to say that don't grace me anymore because I don't need any convincing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have, I'm already convinced. <laughs> and, uh, but that is exactly how we open up, you know, to, to God's love. Yeah. You know, lo- love is not behind, is not far behind a grateful, a thankful heart and grateful mind. Mm. So that's one thing I feel. Yeah. When, when we truly allow ourselves just to stop and really go inward and give our heart to Jesus, hmm. he's always there. Yeah. And he answers in a very personal way. Exactly. <laughs> and then you, you really look back, suddenly you see, wow, how blessed how blessed are we? Yeah, exactly. How blessed? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's just something that I feel so inspired by, looking at, of course, my own life. And right now, you know, living in the community, just looking at everybody's life, mm. I, I really see everybody's life is so touched by Jesus mm. in, in, in very, very small and personal and intimate yep. ways. That's it. And yet sometimes we're in this darkness, we don't see it. Mm. And yeah. we're absorbed yeah. by the darkness. And Jesus is just mm. saying, you know, no matter what it is, you're still connected with yeah. me. You're still connected with your one creator. Yeah, that's it. And if you really want to feel the love you just call on my name exactly yeah and that's what i'm here to do now Mm -hmm. that's it i want everybody to experience the love Mm -hmm. that's my mission Mm -hmm. that's just the only thing that's there Mm. and to have that certainty is everything and that's that's actually something that people say you know i say oh god loves us all Mm. And they say, you say it as if you mean it. I said, I do mean it, because I know it. <laughs> it's as simple as that, you know. Mm-hmm. And then they say, you give me hope. Mm-hmm. Exactly, yeah, that's what I'm here to do, because he loves us all. Yeah, and also the, the, the fact is just your life is such an um, extreme case. Gotcha. And, and And I like the fact that it is extreme case, mm. you know, when it is extreme, you see that, okay, well, if if Jesus reaches you, and not only he reaches yeah. you, but also um, you actually, once you, you choose this other way in your mind, mm. then the path is laid in front of yeah. you. Like you didn't really yeah. have to no. guess and make wrong term, try detours and everything. No, he came. Yeah. I don't know how. He came. Yeah. He came for me, you know. He was waiting for his time. Yeah. And then he came. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there was nothing I could do about it. He just wanted to love me. And these days, right now, what, what, how do you summarize your life right now in the community? <sighs> Joy. <laughs> That's my life. David was right. I am blessed. You know, it was hard for me. It was like being around David. <laughs> I, sh- I, I share this story. Um, so, for example, we were. We, I, I might be taking David to the to the airport. Maybe we were picking someone up, or maybe he was going. It was just me and him in the car. And I come down to come and pick him up, and he says, "You know, you know as he is." And he turns around. And he, the first thing he says to me he says, "What a life we lead!" Yeah. 
And of course, I'm going through my stuff and I'm like, yeah, it's all right for you. you know. <laughs> so this is what I'm saying in my mind. I'm like, yeah, it's all right for you, isn't it? You're off gallivanting and having a great time around the world. And I'm stuck with my nonsense and you're just in this joy. <laughs> you know. Come on, get in the car. <laughs> and so we just like drive in the car and he's like, love you, Kenneth. And I'm like, yeah, you go and have a nice time while I'm stuck with my issues. And he would always tell me, it's always about joy it's all about inspiration. And I thought it was for him. I was like, well, it's all right for you. You're inspired. You're in joy all the time. And then finally, I, I must have given up my stubbornness. And I thought, what if he's right? Huh. What if he's actually right? You know, I can't keep resisting it. What if he's right? And so I started praying for joy all the time. I said, listen, okay, I just want, I just want joy. I just want joyful experiences. Mm-hmm. And this has so helped, you know. And it's like the St. Clair thing. It's like, I don't want to be loved. I want to love, Mm -hmm. yeah? I don't want to hold back. I don't want to hold back any longer. And I think this is what's happened. It's like, I feel, I do, I feel I've got so much joy to give. I feel like I've got so much love to give. And it's like, why would I want to hold back on that? And that's what my experience is now. Some sort of freedom's come into me. Like this fear of abandonment, this fear of rejection. All of a sudden, I just thought, it just happened to me. I just couldn't believe it. I was like, it was like, it dawned on my mind. I'm like, hold on a minute. I'm a prisoner to these silly thoughts in my own mind. And just, I'm afraid of emotions. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. Just some funny emotions running through my body. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, no, mm-hmm. I am going to love. If I want to love, I'm going to love. If I want to give, I'm going to give. If I want to be joyful, I am going to be joyful. And that's the end of it. I am not going to be a prisoner to this any longer. And this is what Jesus is teaching. So that's what I'm going to do. And somehow it's like, you know, dare to love, isn't it? It's just dare to love. Like, oh my God, I might get rejected. So what? Just dare to love. Who cares? You know, there's always someone to catch you. You know, he's always there. That's what basically we're saying, aren't we? No matter what happens. I mean, that's the my whole story in it it's mm-hmm. like you look at my story and you know let's face it probably 90% they say 10% of people in this world are violent and 90% aren't mm-hmm. so I'm sharing to the 90% of people in life and they're like well I've never done all that and Jesus still graced one of the 10% you know mm-hmm. he just doesn't care mm-hmm. he just doesn't care about who you think you are mm-hmm. and so this is the whole point he's always there mm-hmm. and he says you are entitled to this mm-hmm. and so this is why this is why we're here you know it's gone pretty simple and so somehow, you know, he's brought me here. I'm in the middle of Mexico. I'm talking to you on a podcast. And I'm like, what the hell has happened in my life for the past 20 years? And here I am. And you work for Jesus. And I work for Jesus 24-7. I'm the 24-hour hotline, you know. That's it. I'm 24-7. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like the floodgate of miracles got opened up. God, yeah. And That's you, you're like, what am I here to to be afraid of exactly there's so much love to give exactly there's just so much and it's just so beautiful mm-hmm. and yeah that's what i'm learning you know i can see that there's like you know there's a little switch off in the mind and it's like oh my god i just chose not to give love mm-hmm. and it's just a decision in the mind mm-hmm. isn't it mm-hmm. it's just a pure decision to close my heart off but why mm-hmm. you know so yeah, it's actually very simple, and that and that that is literally the course in miracles. It actually is extremely simple. There's, it, it, that's what I love about it because I'm a simple person, and it's just black. <laughs> it's just black and white, you know. S- spirit, ego, <laughs> love, hate. I mean, it's just like, you can't get any more simple than that, can it? Like choose love. That's all. He, that's all he's really telling us, and that's what I love. Mm-hmm. And that is that. That is the bottom line of it. Just start choosing it, and it's going to start happening. The same as I chose unconditional love, and he said, yeah, "There you go." Mm-hmm. There it is. Mm-hmm. I'm here. Mm-hmm. I never left you. You know, that's the whole point. Mm-hmm. I never left you and I never will. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now you are the carrier of Jesus' love and exactly. laughter and joy yep. and the message that you have never disappointed me. Exactly. Disappointed me. Yeah. 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 I really feel that. You're like <laughs> the living carrier. You're, you're the living embodiment yes. of that. That message absolutely that's so beautiful and so uplifting as well feels like yeah it's so simple yeah as you said it's so simple yeah. that's not thinking that all these dark emotions <laughs> you know are fearful yeah 
does not think that we're not able to just break through exactly. to Jesus' love right now. Exactly. Yeah. What a testimony. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel blessed. Extremely yeah. blessed. Yeah, thank you so much, oh, Ken. <laughs> my ple- thank you for inviting me, Francis. I mean, it's just a pleasure <laughs> yeah. to do this with you. Yeah, I have had some t- talks with you, and every time I feel so <laughs> uplifted. <laughs> dynamic yeah. so I thought, okay yeah. let's do this yeah. in the podcast yeah. so I'm so happy yeah yeah oh thank you so much yeah thank you too and thank you everybody for listening in we'll see you next week bye